me because people don't demand the dollars as much anymore. When people stop demanding dollars, our current system has to collapse and we have to go back to manufacturing because people aren't going to take those dollars and trade for our services. I want to run something parallel to the central bank digital currencies. And, and this goes back to one of your guests that, that you had on, Ian Everard. And he said something pretty astonishing, really, really astonishing to, to me anyway. He said that if Putin were to back the Russian ruble with gold, he would be able to do it with gold at about $2,000 per ounce. And he went on to paint a picture where backing the ruble with gold would do significant damage to the Western financial system. Rob, if this were to happen, what do you see happening with the Western markets? So there's a story told by Hugo Salinas Price, who is a very prominent Mexican billionaire who's been on a lot of financial media over the last 10 to 15 years talking about his views. He wrote something in a Mexican magazine talking about that China and Russia had told the U.S. and basically the Western uh, banks, we're, we, we're threatening to back the Chinese yuan, the Russian ruble with gold, you know, going back to a gold-backed currency that would put a tremendous pressure on the dollar politically, geopolitically, and in financial markets, if you think about it. Now, in order for them to do that, they, they have to have more than their stated gold reserves. And everybody believes that they do when you look at inflows and outflows. They're just not reporting it. They're holding it outside of their central banks and the, their sovereign wealth fund, so they don't have to report it. So we believe uh, our data that China and, and Russia are a credible threat to do that because they have more reserves than they're saying, just looking at the flows in and out of those countries. So if they did that, what that would do in the world's mind is, is – if you can back it with something as respected as gold over the last 5,000 years, then what's backing the U.S. dollar? Is it just our military bases? Is it our economy? Um, people would start – it would be a multipolar world, Patrick. People would start to maybe have foreign uh, holdings of the yuan and of the ruble and use that as the trading currency, you know, a, a de facto – you know, uh, multiple reserve currency in the world that would change things a lot. And if confidence is lost in the dollar, U.S. dollar crashes on the U.S. dollar index compared to other currencies, it changes a lot of things. It changes valuations of our bond market, our stock market, our real estate market. It, I mean, it does change a lot. And it takes away the ability of the Americans to export inflation, you know, in our service-based economy because people don't demand the dollars as much anymore. When people stop demanding dollars, our current system has to collapse. And we have to go back to manufacturing because people aren't going to take those dollars and trade for our services. We're going to have to go back to creating actual goods to support our economy. So I do think that it would have a huge impact if that were to happen. Uh, whether or not that actually happened, um, I've heard it from a couple of sources unverified. Um, it is an interesting thought experiment. And it wouldn't surprise me if China and Russia have considered this, because why wouldn't you if you've been you know, living in the U.S. dominating the markets uh, – the economic markets using their military because of the strength of the dollar to project across the world. And you see the geopolitical tensions between Russia, China, and the U.S. You know, really the easiest way to cause America trouble is to not get into hot conflicts. It's really to put pressure on the U.S. dollar because that's what everything in the U.S. is based upon. The faith and credit of the U.S. government towards the dollar, which is not backed by anything. It's a piece of, or a piece of linen. We see a piece of paper. It's really a piece of linen. It's just, it's, it's cloth, you know, what's backing that? <clears throat> if pressure comes on the dollar, all of a sudden you see real quickly that nothing's really backing it other than faith. And if people lose faith, then what else do you have? You know, we, we talked about some very significant life-changing points here where, you know, stagflation, inflation, the, the dollar being revalued, a new monetary system and, and things like that. Why do you think the majority of people just do not love gold, do not love silver, or gold and silver just simply go unnoticed? Well, in 1930s, by executive order, which is unconstitutional, by the way, but you know, people see an executive order from the president, they take it seriously. You know, the U.S. confiscated gold. Now, not all the gold was confiscated, but a lot of it was from the citizens. And then for a long time, you couldn't hold gold even as, a, as an asset, much less as money. And it wasn't until people were allowed to own gold again, but there two generations, Patrick, had passed before people were allowed to own gold again. So it had been demonetized in the U.S., and you weren't even allowed to own it. And it was a criminal act to, to have it. 
unless you had certain things like collectibles and certain classes of it. But the average everyday person certainly wasn't going to be able to afford that. So we had programmed people for two generations to accept a different system. And so that's why people don't see gold the way they traditionally have here in the U.S. And there's even a cool thing in this IMF paper talking about the central bank digital currency and the currency reset. Well, they say, we know from studying history that you need at least one generation to change people's minds. So they know that they're going to need about 20 years to get people into central bank digital currencies and away from cash. Well, think about what we've had the last 10 years. We've been talking about digital currencies, Bitcoin. You know, so we're halfway through that cycle of where you know, what you have to do is the older generations who only trust cash basically have to become a less of a dominant force in the political cycle so that they can't put political pressure on to maintain the old system. New generation has to be con conditioned to accept the new system. That's already been done throughout history since 1971 being off gold, purely fiat system. Uh, people couldn't own gold for a long time. But most people don't own it now. And they don't understand the class. They think it's, you know, an old barbarous, barbarous relic as the saying goes, but that's what the Keynesians have been saying. And think about all the kids that have grown up in this Keynesian system. You know, I'm Gen X and we grew up in the Keynesian system. The last people to remember a gold-backed currency were the boomers and they're starting to retire. And you look at, in terms of demographics, <clears throat> the boomers had 77 million in the U.S. And in the U.S. alone, the millennials have 92 million. So it's a bigger generation that don't even know what the old system was, nor care. So is it, that's basically what happens over time. You know, things change and people adopt new systems and, and that's where we are. So I, I think all of that's been laid in place really over time. Yeah, you know, this new system, obviously it's going to be central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. What's your perhaps one or two biggest concerns with CBDCs? Well, they're not decentralized like a Bitcoin. I'm not the huge Bitcoin fan anyway, but I understand why it exists. It exists as an alternative to fiat currencies. And positive proponents of Bitcoin, I'm not talking about the speculators and scam artists, and which you know the crypto market has a ton of them because it's a new market and um, not a lot of regulation. <clears throat> but you know the private cryptos exist <clears throat> as an alternative to the dollar. The central bank digital currencies are not private. Uh, they are centralized. They're using some of the technology of the cryptocurrencies, but they, what they are is a closed loop system and the government authorities control how much of it. So there's not like a 21 or 27 million coin limit, anything like that, whatever these private currencies have. That what it is, if you understand the research, is it's a system in which they want to use it to control aggregate mo aggregate monetary flow. There are two main controls that they want to use according to the IMF. They want to use taxes, the amount of the tax rate over the long term to affect how much money is in the system and how much revenue the government gets. But through the, the traditional banking system and the use of central bank digital currencies, which would be linked then, they want to control aggregate. And so in the IMF paper, they talk about, well, you earn $100, but we're going to have a discount rate and you may only have $95 in your bank account before you get to spend it. In the transmission from wherever you're getting the money to when it hits your bank account, they apply that discount rate. So that's negative interest rates, not in bonds, but in the banking system. Why? Because in the same paper, the IMF said we got to get rid of bond because they, the way they have to manage bond is very old and clunky and slow. In other words, they want to push button manage the economy. So the central bank digital currencies are very much a way for them to instantaneously discount the value of your digital dollar and therefore of your spending power and therefore of the labor that you use to produce that at whatever rate they want and to control those aggregate monetary flows. It's not good for individuals, but it's really a central planner's uh, dream. That's what they want. And so there are some risks to individuals with a central bank digital currency system. And I think people really should go read the papers and, and view my videos from last year talking about this. I need to do a refresher video that people have been asking me to really just walk people, you know, step by step again through this. But it's not a, it's not like Bitcoin. Certainly, it's not like the dollar. And people should just make them make themselves aware of what this truly is, you know, before uh, they accept what the central bank wants to put out.